This is the Last Minute Blues Podcast with Jeff Burton, Donnie Fandango, and former Blues defenseman Jamie Rivers. Powered by Together Credit Union, empowering you to achieve your financial goals. It is the Last Minute Blues Podcast. Donnie Fandango and Jamie Rivers here, wishing our homeboy Jeff Burton all of the best as he is uh, currently in a battle right now. Yeah, he's battling his tail off, as Jeff always does. So he needs a little extra rest, a little recovery time here. His chair is always open. We'll be waiting for him to come back off the IR real soon. We're just keeping it just keeping it warm for him. Yep. That's all we're doing. So, uh, Jamie, I had a whole other line of things that I was going to talk to you about today, how we were going to start this podcast, <laughs> a whole different direction. And then I saw that report earlier today, probably around 11, from Frank Saravelli, and uh, ooh, uh, it got my brain uh, percolating. So the long and short of it, were a couple of things. One, that Vladimir Tarasenko is still interested in leaving. All right? That his trade demand is still out there. He hasn't and rescinded. He has not demand. rescinded it. Correct. I mean, this is according to Frank Saravelli, too. Correct. So, again, let's just everything with a little bit of gra- little grain of salt. Grain of salt. All right. So I got to calm down. Off the hamster wheel. Uh, but then also, a little nugget in that same article was the potential shopping of one Tory Krug. And that surprises the bejesus out of me because we're already kind of trying to think of who's going to replace Nick Letty. Mm -hmm. And so now in my mind, I'm like, oh, crap. Now we're going to have to replace Nick Letty and potentially Krug. Let's just kind of talk about all of this stuff, starting with the Tory Krug stuff. Okay, so I don't know if the word shopping is necessarily correct in this scenario. I could be wrong. I don't know. I'm not, you know. I'm not in tight with Army in his office right now going over these things. I just can't imagine he's shopping Tory Krug. I think that teams may be calling on Tory Krug and kicking the tires and exploring whether or not the player would maybe waive his complete full no trade clause, mind you. So the player would have to have uh, the player would have to agree 100 percent to being traded, uh-huh. which uh, Donnie, I don't know about you. That makes it more difficult. Oh, hundred percent. You're not. Yeah. You're not sending me to Ottawa. You're or, not sending or, me to Calgary or wherever. You know, I know what I mean? that's where our, our listeners are going to go. Oh, send him to Calgary for <laughs> Kachuk. All right, he's going to say no, thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, Calgary's a beautiful place. I love Calgary. Some players, U.S. born players in particular, would rather not play in Calgary. Mm-hmm. So to each their own. <laughs> right. Whatever. <laughs> um, so I think the word shopping is a bit strong but you have a situation where you have to you have to address your left shot top four defenseman i know you're thinking to yourself right now well tory krug's one of those guys so you're just gonna get rid of a guy i know it's crazy i wouldn't do it i would for me i would prefer to shop scott perunovich however Mm -hmm. think a year or two down the road is what army's doing i think and what he looks at is we have a very similar player to Tory Krug and Scott Perunovic. Similar. In two years, could he be as good, if not better, with the, uh, with the understanding that Tory Krug's play might decline with age? Just, mm-hmm. I mean, father time just gets you. And Scott Perunovic's play might increase as far as his potential. So if you do that, you're looking at basically the same player. But he'll be a lot more cost-controlled than Tory Krug at that point. So if you were to move a Tory Krug, you could potentially re-sign a Nick Letty right away because you'd be, you know, Nick Letty's not going to command $7 million on the open market. It's just not. Maybe four, four and a half. So now you're two and a half to the good. Plus, you have to imagine that Perunovic is going to be on a league minimum salary. Mm -hmm. You've just got a lot of cap space, and you still have a power play quarterback in Scott Perunovic. You have Nick Letty, who proved that he can do it when called upon. You have Justin Falk, who can do it. So you've got options. Whew. I got to tell you, as you're explaining all of this, my mind is exploding on the inside <laughs> of, a, of all of the, but 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 of all of the possibilities, and it makes a lot of sense to me as far as the type of player goes. And and this might not mean anything. This is where you always set us straight, but it worries me sometimes about the beating that Krug can take back there Mm -hmm. not being a really big guy. You know what I mean? I wonder if that could potentially lead to to some of those numbers going down as he gets older, too. Well, it's all in play, right? Like uh, injuries and age is the demise of any athlete. 
except for Tom Brady. Apparently, he just keeps getting better. Dude, so. unbelievable. <laughs> well, yeah, but we'll leave that alone because that's its own category all by itself. But yeah, so you just don't know, you know. And this last injury he had, you know how how bad was it? Now it didn't require surgery, and they, you know he would have played in a game seven, according to the Blues, or at least according to reports from Tory Krug's side of things. Had the Blues gotten to a game seven against the Avalanche, so you one would think, okay, he's going to be fine. But what happens the next time or the next time? Right. And I think that if you look at Tory Krug, what's he got? Six years left on his deal, maybe yeah. five years left. You wouldn't have to go five years or four years with a Nick Letty. You could go with three years there. And with a Perunovic, you're probably going to look to do a bridge deal at two years. So for the next two to three years, you could be cost-controlled in that position with money to spend on the cap if you were to move a Tory Krug. Man, this the that's way, if. The, the, the way that this is the chess game and the way that Doug Armstrong plays this is so fascinating to me. You know what I mean? Because, again, and, and I don't think that this gets talked about enough. We all know it, but but the deals that happen in the next couple of days or couple of weeks are not just affecting this season, but it's going forward. And the, the, the ramifications of every move you make, that's what's so fascinating to me. The, the, again, the ripple effects of all of these sorts of things. Yeah, and again, we have to highlight that Tory Krug has a full no-trade clause. So it would have to be a deal that he would approve. Um, and sometimes those can be tough yeah. because now you're handcuffed. We saw what happened with Vladimir Tarasenko last year with his no-trade clause, and he gave a list of like teams that were already over the cap, basically. Army couldn't move them, didn't move them. It worked out great for both sides. And that brings us back to your first part. Yes, yeah, so, then, so then, Jamie, what happens now? What happens with Vladdy? At this point, I, I, at this point, I have a really tough time thinking that he starts the season as a blue for real this time. I, so here's where I get a little bit, oh, I don't know, frustrated sometimes. Maybe frustrated is not the word. I don't know. I'll explain it, and you can tell me what the uh, word Frustrated is. with me? No, not with you. Okay, no. okay. No, not yet, anyways. Um, <laughs> give it time. We're still early give in the podcast. <laughs> no, it is Vladimir Tarasenko, the individual, has never come out and said, a thing. The report was in a Russian newspaper. Initially. The initially, initial report. Mm-hmm. And then his agent said, didn't didn't deny it. And then everything kind of went away. And now all of a sudden, you know, he has not rescinded his, his request yet. But we still haven't heard that from anybody. Like, if, if I was Vladimir Tarasenko's agent, I would be out, out in front of it right now, this week, specifically, and send out a some kind of a tweet or social media saying, hey, Vladimir Tarasenko, or get a hold of a media outlet and say, hey, do you want an exclusive interview with me? I'll talk to you about Vladimir Tarasenko. So maybe Jeremy Rutherford, hey, pick up the phone, you know, give me a call. Mm -hmm. And you say, my client, Vladimir Tarasenko, uh, loves St. Louis, but still is looking for a new challenge. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, His his trade request is still on the table. Uh, If it cannot be met, Vladimir Tarasenko will be happy to play the last year of his contract in St. Louis. That's what I would be doing yeah. if I was his agent. Um, reason being is you're letting all the teams in the NHL know now that, hey, he's still open for business. Call Army mm-hmm. if you're interested in a over a point a game guy from last year. Okay, but then, Jamie, what really has changed since last year and this initial trade request in the sense that a lot of those same teams that he wants to go to are are already at the cap or will be and still can Donnie. So they're gonna points. So what you're saying is they'll find a way to get those eighty five points in and to make the salary cap work if they want it bad enough. That's right. So a team that was on the fence last year, maybe, looked at an injured, aging player. E Tarasenko hasn't been what he has been before. Boom. He has a breakout year, shows everybody that he's still big daddy Vladdy out there. And now okay. The doubts we had last year we're willing to dance now. Hey, Army, pick up the phone. Boy, oh boy. So this could, I mean, the, 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 the turnover here seems like it could potentially be substantial. When it, yep. Again, potentially, and these potentially, are all rumors, all is, and you know, we don't yeah, know. Who knows? Who is, knows? Is this the busiest time of the year for the front office, for the Blues? Is this when it is just nonstop popping? And, 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 like, when does this lead up to the draft and free agency? When does the madness start? Oh, it started. Right. It's, it's started. Full, I mean, full swing, obviously. Full swing. Here. Two weeks out from the draft. Usually, actually, that's not true. Usually after the last buzzer goes on the Stanley Cup, once it's hoisted above somebody's head, the very next day, 
it's on. Mm-hmm. It's on. People are moving and shaking. Heck, you see the Tampa Bay Lightning already trading McDonough. Like, there's been times where in Chicago in years past, two days or three days after winning the Cup, bam, they've made a trade and got rid of somebody because you have to get ahead of it. And so it's been crazy for a while. And this is the busiest time for the front office because trade deadline probably has more action when it comes to, like, player uh, trades and things like that. But you have trades, you have the amateur draft, and you have free agency all hitting within a ten day span. I, I how is that? And I how is that regulated? How does Doug Armstrong keep him? I mean, obviously he's very good at this, so he's done it a while. But like, how do you keep yourself straight? Do you have one group of people working on the free agents, one group working on the the kids for the draft, that sort of thing? So what you have is you have your amateur side, your amateur scouting, and your amateur staff. They're in charge of the draft. They present every option available, and Army and you know Al McInnes and these guys will all sit down and evaluate at the end of, like, when it comes time to do business. Mm-hmm. Same time, you have your pro scouting staff, which is a staff that scours the AHL and all around the NHL and your own team, for that matter. And they're going to come up with potential unrestricted free agents that are great fits, potential trade candidates that would be fantastic, potential um, add-on pieces. So when a team wants to throw a player in on a deal, you've scouted that player. It's a yes or a no on that player based on what his future potential could be. And then you have the capologist side of it, the money people. And they're the ones that at the end of the day go, yes, or no, we can't do that. Okay, well then what do we have to do in order to make it work? Well, you'd have to alleviate this much cap space. Okay, let's get back to work. And let's go find the players that match that number or deals that can potentially be done. So we have three separate departments that are going. And Army has to trust his staff. And when they come back to him at the end of the day, because he has the final say, he's got to make the decision. Boy, oh boy. And he, I mean, seemingly, from what we've seen the last handful of years, the man has put together an incredible organization of people. So, so, so these good are that people... other teams have been poaching it. Now. Absolutely. Like Bill Armstrong's so. a GM now in Arizona. Uh, Rob DeMaio has left. Lots of guys have left, not because they're unhappy, because they've been elevated. They've been promoted to a, to a higher position with another organization. And the fact that they've had so much success here in St. Louis, continued success, is exactly why these guys are getting jobs. So Army knows how to pick a staff. Mike Greer got named the general manager of the San Jose Sharks yeah, yesterday, which I which I, I thought was fantastic. And I didn't realize that his brother is the general manager of the Dolphins. Yeah. How, how amazing is that? That that probably has not happened. Do you think Tua can skate? I mean, I think he has a better chance of being a better football or hockey player than he does oh, being a football player. What about player. Tyreek? Imagine how fast he could skate. Tyree well, Hill? you know what? Tyreek isn't going to have Patrick Mahomes throwing in the ball this year, so I think Tyree is in for a very rude awakening. But I'm very biased on this particular situation. Yeah. Why is that, Donnie? They, they're a they're an AFC East foe oh. of my Buffalo Bills. Oh, that's so right. So yeah. I am a I am not only a disliker of the Dolphins, I freaking hate the <laughs> Dolphins. As a matter of fact, but no, but Greer that 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 you know Greerzy thing... was a St. Louis Blues draft pick. Absolutely yeah. so. Absolutely so. He was. Uh, I think he was the round right after me. We were drafted the same year, I believe. Unbelievable. What is he going to do with that San Jose team? He said they're not going to do a full full teardown. Who is going to be that defenseman that they spin off? Who's going to take on that money in those contracts? Nobody. Really? So you don't see Burns? You don't see Carlson? You don't see uh, Vlasic? Uh, yeah, Pickles? Whatever that guy's name. Mark you don't see Vlasic. Yeah, there you go. That guy, th- either one of those three, you don't see anybody biting? Well, not unless they're going to retain half of the salary. And I don't know about you, but if I'm a brand new GM coming in, I don't want to be paying dead money. Like, I don't want to be trading a player and covering half of it, eating half of his pay on my own salary cap. I'd rather, you know, like do the Bill Guerin thing and buy those guys out, get rid of them. You're still going to get nailed on the salary cap for it, and it's going to be a tough road for the Minnesota Wild because they're going to be eating a couple of big contracts because Bill Guerin did that. But I don't know what else you do. If you're Mike Greer, like, I would try to move on from Eric Carlson mm-hmm. as bad as I could possibly do that. I would keep Brent Burns. I think he's a fixture. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you know what? Maybe we're overpaying. Maybe we're not getting what we used to. But that's to. okay because you're a San Jose guy through you're and through. You're a guy. Mm-hmm. Look at, you're the bearded guy. You're the this or that. You're the face of the franchise, quite honestly. Um, yeah, I'm okay. I'll, I'll take this one for yeah. the team. But the Eric Carlson one, 
That's the one that kills you right now. And uh, Vlasic, Vlasic's fine. He's been there since the first day he played in the NHL. He's kind of a fixture as well there. You know, it is what it is. Sometimes you just have to live with a bad contract when you take over. But it's going to be interesting to see what he does. How how bad is this, though? Like, Mike Greer is an excellent hire as far as an individual. I don't know what he can do as a GM. I have no idea. He's never been a GM. Yeah. Uh, so time will tell. I know he was a great hockey player. I know he was a really good assistant coach. I know he's done a great job as a scout. And I know that overall, he's an amazing individual. Nobody has ever, nobody has ever said anything bad about Mike Greer. So he's going to be okay. The ownership, though, I'm questioning a little bit in San Jose. You had all of these coaching vacancies hit, like seven or eight coaching vacancies around the NHL. And you waited until every single one of them was filled, and then you fired your head coach and his staff. Makes no sense. Wait, why? why? Is it, here, here's two, two ways for me to look at it, Donnie. One, you really hated Bob Bugner. And you wanted to screw him over so bad. He did something you just didn't like, and you're like, okay, just wait. And bam, you screwed him over. Or or the candidate that they wanted to coach their team is still available, and none of the other teams took them. Like I'm thinking like a Rick Tockett. That, that's the okay? first name it's, that came to mind. It's, it's the only thing that pops in my head going, what if San Jose is like, wow, Rick Tockett didn't get scooped up? We want him. Sorry, Bob Bugner, you're gone. Right. Well, because that might make a little sense because I've read. the only thing that makes sense. Because I've read rumors that Tockett didn't necessarily want to coach a full rebuild. And so while this isn't a full rebuild, you know, maybe that's. He's still going to have his hands full. I mean, he's still going to have his hands full. You don't ever get to take a job over as a head coach ordinarily where the team is established. Mm -hmm. There's a reason they just fired their head coach. Because things weren't going well. Right. So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The reason for said change. Yes, exactly. Now, the Winnipeg Jets, that was a real ideal job. Rick Bonus got the job there. I don't know why they hired Rick Bonus. I like Rick Bonus, but it, he's a great assistant coach at this point. Did a good job in Dallas, but why didn't Dallas resign him then? Well, why did he walk from Dallas? Or why did Jim Neal? Why did they part amicably? Why? He wanted somebody better. Yeah. In my opinion. And Pete DeBoer, yeah. I mean, in absolutely. In my opinion. Yeah. And, you know, so I look at Winnipeg and I'm going, and I know their full court press was Barry Trotz. And Barry Trotz just said, well, I'm going to take a year off of whatever and, and just kind of sit back and relax. And then they, they pivoted. I just don't know if Rick Bonus is the guy. It doesn't matter. My opinion is my opinion. It doesn't make a lick of difference. I'm just looking at it going that most teams that are looking for a new head coach are not usually in a great situation. Yeah, the timing of that was very, very curious. Yeah, it's it's weird. So, so I'm anxious to see ultimately what they do. You you are in a, in a really unique position in that the NHL draft is tomorrow, um, and you have been there, and you have had the anticipation and the what's going to happen next. And I just have, I just cannot comprehend being a 17, 18-year-old, 19-year-old kid and having this sort of thing staring you right mm -hmm. in the face. Jamie, where were you? Because I remember you told us the story because you got taken a couple rounds later yeah. because of a like a fight or something yeah, like that. Yeah, a bar fight. Kids <sighs> at home, don't do it. Don't do it. Although it wasn't my fault. Yeah. I, I never got charged or anything like that because the guy basically sucker punched me and then unfortunately wasn't as good at fighting as I was. <laughs> and, uh, so therefore, Sorry. Uh, it didn't end up very good for him. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it happened, you know, just a couple weeks ahead of the draft. And I was rated at the bottom of the first round, and I dropped all the way to the third round. Teams, my whole week leading up to it, like right now, players are being interviewed on a daily basis by each team. They're asking them questions, you know, all this stuff. And the number one thing that got brought up right away with me is, do we have to worry about you off the ice? And, I, you know, it was frustrating because I had worked so hard to put myself in a position to be selected in the first yeah, round. Yeah, worked I mean your whole everything. young life, young adult life. Everything. And now this this had become the number one talking point. And it sucked. And you know, all you can do is sit there and defend yourself and say, "Hey, listen. Go look, you know, go ask anybody. Like I I don't have a record. I don't this doesn't yeah. happen a lot, you know. It has happened. I mean, but it had doesn't happen a lot. I work hard. I always want to win. I'm really competitive. You basically end up like trying to sell yourself, yeah. and it's like, I don't know. I got tired of that process during it too. I was tired of like trying to sell myself. I'm like, you guys watch me play. Like, you either like me or you don't. Yeah. I got to a point where San Jose, oddly enough, the the Sharks. This is a funny story. Is that there were like twenty 
guys in a room, and they used to treat it almost like an interrogation session. Times have changed. Teams are way more relaxed, way more comfortable with the players, and they're getting better results that way. But it was set up like an interrogation. I was in a chair sitting in front of like 20 grown, older hockey men, and they were talking to me, and they asked me, of course, do we have to worry about you? And I was like, no, you don't. And they said, okay, well, we have a, a camp that we send all of our draft picks to in Brainerd, Minnesota, for three months of the summer. And, uh, you know, they go there, and basically it's uh, you get up, you work out, you go skate in the afternoon, and, you know, you do the same thing over and over and over. And you get the weekends off, and there's a lake there, and it's awesome. And I said, uh, so if the San Jose Sharks draft you, you know, are you willing to go to Brainerd, Minnesota? And I sat back, paused. I go, nah. <laughs> what? I'm like, nah. I don't think I need to do that. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Well, this is, you got to remember now, I just told you, I gotten, this is the process now. I'm starting to get exhausted. Right, right. And I didn't want to spend three months in Brainerd. Why? Yeah. And I, they, they, they looked at me like I had a third eye. <laughs> I bet they did. And one guy steps up and says, well, what do you mean, No. I said, if I can't get done what I need to be done and be ready for camp, the next year I will go. But I spend enough time away from home and on the road and on the run, basically, for the whole year. Uh, No, I can train and I can get better and I can be ready to go on my own. And if I'm not, I'll agree to go the next summer. I don't know. I kind of feel like that's a good answer, but I'm not a hockey GM. No, so. no they, the meeting was over. <laughs> They're like, all right, we'll get back to you. Thank you, Mr. I Williams. walked out in the hallway, and my agent was standing in the hallway. Uh, Pat Morris at the time, Don Meehan, Pat Morris, like Newport Sports, like the bad guys, the Petro guys, the bad guys. They're great guys, anyways. And I walked out, and I looked at Pat, and I go, I think you can scratch the sharks off the list. <laughs> he, got, he said, what you do? <laughs> like, I was just honest, man. <laughs> And so he giggled. So how did you find out that you were drafted? Well, you're right there in the arena. Like, okay, so you were so you were present. Yeah. Did you have mom, dad with you? Mom, dad, brother with oh, me, and man. that's just my family. Um, that was it. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was a tough day. It was a great day. It was a tough day for me because I'm watching the first round go by, watching the second round go by. And, you know, at this point, like I'm in blackout rage almost. Mm-hmm. And third round is going – and then when the St. Louis Blues pick came up, I had had two really good meetings with the Blues. And it was unexpected. We didn't expect them to be on at all. They had Jeff Brown, that Steve Duchesne. Like, they had plenty of offensive defensemen. Mm-hmm. And uh, after the first meeting, my agent said, man, they, they like you. Like, they really thought that went well. And, and Ron Caron, for those who don't remember Ron Caron, he was a straight shooter, man. And so am I. And so we sat there and talked hockey, and he talked baseball. He loved the Montreal Expos. He was mm-hmm. from Canada, and I'm from Ottawa. And so we talked about all sorts of craziness uh, and not necessarily hockey stuff. And he basically said, uh, our scouts have seen you enough. Like, we know what you are as a player. Mm-hmm. want to know what you are as a person. And he did say, I'll never forget this. He goes, because when you put the blue note on, he says, you're representing our city. And so – I, I was like, wow, okay. Never looked at it that way. Sure. Um, Pretty heavy for an 18-year-old. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, and I just said, I'm ready. I said, look at where I just played. I said, I'm way in northern Ontario in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. When you put on that jersey, you're representing the city. Like, you better be tough. You better be ready to go, and you better play hard. And that's just the standard. So I said, I respect the fact that, you know, I respect the responsibility of, of doing that. So then – Follow it up with the second meeting, like the right before the draft, this one. And I didn't expect to get a second meeting. And Ron Caron just, he had more questions about like Ottawa and the area where I grew up and like nothing to do with hockey. And um, so fast forward to the draft. Um, they had a, fir- a second round pick. They did not have a first round pick that year. They had a second round pick and they picked a guy named Maxim Betts. Yeah, I remember the name. Not a good pick. No. <laughs> not a good pick. <laughs> I actually thought I was going in the second round to the Blues. That's how well things had gone. So then when they picked Max and Betts, I was like, oh, boy. Like, it'll never get back to them. Like, there's no way. Well, it did. And then I saw Ron Caron um, was tur- in his chair, and he kind of turned around and started pointing, like, in my direction. He's, you have all the players in one area. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't know if he was pointing at me. And you're like, ah. 
And then all of a sudden, you know, they get up on the mic and like St. Louis Blues select from Ottawa, Ontario, defenseman Jamie Rivers. And it's like, bam, it's over. Now you're like, whoa, I'm officially part of the NHL. Yeah. You hug your mom, your dad, your brother. Uh, your agent usually comes up and grabs you. And then they have a, a greeter. Susie Matthew was working for the Blues at the time. Yeah. She met me when you come down the stairs and walked me over to the table. And uh, apparently I was her pick. Two. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> Apparently I was. And she said, uh, it's a true story. Susie Matthew to this day was like, I really like that Jamie Rivers guy. Uh, was She was like, in my corner, you need to pick Rivers. You need to pick Rivers. And finally they picked me. And she, I remember her telling me as we we're walking to the table, you are my pick. I picked you. <laughs> and I was like, all right. And I put on the jersey. Uh, and you meet everybody, and you shake hands, and it's it's very overwhelming. Dude, what are you even thinking? Like, like what what is your brain... What is your brain even thinking besides, I can't wait to go out after this and get absolutely hammered? <laughs> First thing I thought of was, I can't wait to make the team next year. Like That was my thought. Man. I remember telling Ron Karan that. I'm like, I'm going to play for your team next year, which was kind of unheard of at 18, and I didn't. Um, but I did play 19, and like then, of course, I did go out. My brother was there, and my brother's four years older than me. He was already playing in the NHL at mm-hmm. the time. And so he had a bunch of people, and it was in Quebec City, too. Oh, baby. Oh, so yeah. we had friends. Oh, God, yeah. And so we did. We had a great time. Uh, but that was kind of my draft experience was that. And you go for a big dinner afterwards, your family, your agent. Your agent usually takes out, like, his top ten guys or whatever that got drafted. And it's it's overwhelming. It's a whirlwind experience. It's crazy. But it was awesome. It was pretty amazing. If If, if you were in a position, and I'm sure you have been, to give any of these guys any sort of advice – as they get ready to to get into the league, what would it be? Well, my advice is to spend, treat it like a job, okay? Because times have changed. I wouldn't have given this advice to a guy in 1993. Because in 1993, I would have said, hey, take a couple weeks or a month and relax in the off season because you're going to need it type thing. Well, fast forward to where we are today, I would suggest that somebody treats it like a job. Uh, but, you know, normal people, uh, 40 hours a week that you'd work. I don't think that's necessary, but I do think that you work for five, six hours a day, Mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know, be a professional with your craft. So it doesn't mean go out and work out for five hours a day. What it means is you get your personal trainer, you get your workout in, you get your nutrition done, you eat properly. Maybe there's a yoga class you go to later on in the afternoon. Maybe there's a stretch that you can be a part of. Maybe there's a Pilates class the next day. Maybe there's a skating coach, a skills coach, like you should be busy four days a week of getting after it to get better. Then, then I'm a firm believer in three days off. Space them out however you want. Mm-hmm. Now, three in a row is tough because then your body feels like it's always trying to recover. And so I, I used to go like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. That's kind of the way I used to do it, and I was always ready to go. So that would be my advice: is understand now that the work you're putting in. In this moment, sucks at times, and it's a big commitment, but it's going to pay off in the long run. Man, I, I just, I, I just get so excited. Just as a parent too, I get so sentimental. And when you see the pick announced, oh, yeah. and you see mom and dad and the girlfriend or whatever, it's just such a really wonderful moment. And I think of all the hard work that the kids did to get to that particular point. And and you know, I, it's just it's something that I enjoy watching. So the Blues do have a first round pick tomorrow night. Yeah. I wonder if they're going to still have that pick by the time the draft rolls around tomorrow. I would imagine that Doug Armstrong has explored trading the pick or using that pick as a part of a package to trade up in the draft. It's not a strong draft. Top 10 players are strong. Mm -hmm. Uh, After that, you got good hockey players, but they're not projected to be like in the NHL next year or the year after. So if if you use your pick as the St. Louis Blues this year, you're looking three years from now to have that player maybe make your team. So it's a long-term investment. That's why I would package that pick in a deal. Mm -hmm. Either one way to lose, to shed salary cap, maybe you take a Marco Scandella and you add the first-round pick and you send it to Team X. Now you've got more money to work with. Right. Now you've made a deal. And that's just an example. That's not – Sure. I don't know anything. Yeah. But that's how you can use a late first-round pick in a weak draft to help teams be motivated – to take on said salary. Like, if you move that to Arizona, Arizona then ends up with three picks in the first round. That's enticing to a team that's on a rebuild. Right. 
So that's what I would be doing. Boy, a lot is going to be happening with the NHL over the course of the next oh, yeah. week It'll or be so. Fun. So when does free agency start? It's next week. It's like the 13th or yeah, something it like is. that? it's the 13th. I will uh, I'll be enjoying that while I'm on a beach in Fort Morgan, Alabama. Oh. Fandango family vacation. We leave on Sunday. Wow. Yeah, yeah man. Did you guys get a huge place there? Yeah, or? we did, actually. Uh, like my, an Airbnb, my, big house? Uh, it wasn't an Airbnb, but, but like, like same, same yeah, yeah, yeah. situation thing. But it is legitimately beach- the house we're staying in, uh, my folks are coming, my brother and sister are coming, the kids, my kids have never been to the to the beach before. Wow. So this is like the first time for all of it. We haven't been on a vacation in like three years. Dude, I cannot wait. Donnie, I have a swimsuit you can borrow if you'd like. I'm sure it's too small, Jamie. <laughs> Thank you, though, man. I, I appreciate it, but... Uh, There's I, a couple of pictures I put out there over the weekend. Yeah, yeah, I saw. <laughs> you're freaking ripped, man. You're, not, only, not only are you ripped, but because you're ripped, you can wear like... Regular dude swim trunks? I can't do that. I have to wear the baggy ones, man. I got to do something to offset what happens when I take my shirt off. It's almost more fun to be that way, though. It's almost more fun. Well, hey, man. I mean, it's certainly easier. That's for sure. (laughs) For uh, Jamie Rivers, Donnie Fandango, and our homeboy Jeff Burton, it is the Last Minute Blues Podcast. As always, thanks very much for listening. The Last Minute Blues Podcast. Hear more at 1057thepoint.com. Powered by Together Credit Union. Empowering you to achieve your financial goals.